right. Okay, let's continue. Scandium is a low density metal which has only one of oxidation states in its compounds. Scandium compounds are white solid which form colorless solution. Titanium, the next metal in the period, is far more typical transition element. How would the properties of titanium differ from those of scandium? How would it be? Is it, okay, we said um, scandium is a low density metal, which has only one of the oxidation state in its compound. Scandium metals are white solid, which form colorless solution. Titanium, the next metal in the scandium is far more typical transition element. How would the properties of titanium differ from those of scandium? And if scandium has low um, density, one thing we know about titanium is that it has um, a high density because it's a typical transition element. Titanium is a typical transition element, while scandium is not a typical transition element. So because of that, remember, all they are just asking us is give us the properties of transition element. The one I gave you before, I said, number one, paramagnetic in nature. They are paramagnetic in nature. They have a variable oxidation state. That means it's going to have, they already told us that scandium has only one oxidation state. So that means titanium will have more than one oxidation state because they have variable oxidation states. Uh, I thought I spoke about complex ion formation. So they have complex ion formation when we met. And then what was the last thing I spoke about? Catalyst, yes. They act as catalysts. That's just the answer. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. Now, the next one is um, coming. The next, oh, sorry, what's happening now? Oh, next one is scandium fluoride is an ionic compound. The valency of scandium in scandium fluoride is free. Draw a diagram which shows that the formula of this compound, the charges on the ions, the arrangement of valence electrons, and the negative um such 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 like okay scandium fluoride let me see what you said is an ionic compound the valency of scandium in scandium fluoride is three okay draw a diagram which shows the formula of this compound the charges on the ions and the arrangement of the valency electrons and the negative this use x to represent an electron from fluorine atom and zero to represent an electron from scandium. Now, what you know about scandium, it's a, scandium is SCF3. Now, is scandium is, is an ionic compound. When this is an ionic compound, that means, um, you know, one of the properties of electrovalent bond is that it involves transfer of electrons. It's an ionic compound. So, um, what the, the formula would be SCF3. SCF3, so we'll be having three fluorine atom. Remember, fluorine is a word, it's an halogen. So fluorine just needs um, one of scandium. So three fluorine atom coming together. I need you to visualize it, um, the bonding, when you're drawing the bonding situation. Three fluorine atom coming together to partake of um, to, to, to extract or to collect one molecule, one um, electron from scandium. Since fluorine is already seven, just needs one electron to be stable. So three fluorine atom coming to get that, um, coming at the other end, coming at the other end, just like um, as if they are sharing the electron. So that's how it's going to look like. The, so they said this X to represent an electron from fluorine atom. You see that? I use zero to represent an electron from scandium atom. So we have three fluorine coming together, three fluorine atom coming together to um, partake of, like call it the shear of scandium. That's how, I think that's, that would be quite easy for you to do. The next one is scandium oxide is insoluble in water. Describe how you could show that scandium is an amphoteric oxide. Now, what we just need to do is, uh, what we need to do, how do you show that scandium is an amphoteric oxide? 
we are going to react it with a strong acid, a strong acid and a strong alkali. Then we we'll see how it reacts or neutralizes both acid and alkali. So a, an example of a strong acid is H2SO4. So reacting scandium with, um, reacting it with, well, for, first and foremost, we should look at what's the, what is the, what do we mean amphoteric oxide? Amphoteric oxide means that it, it has the properties of um, an acid and has the properties of a base. So it can dissolve in an acid to form a solution. It can dissolve in a base to form a solution. So what we just need to do is react scandium with a strong acid, which is a, a, a strong acid like um, H2SO4 or HCl, and then react it with a strong alkali, which is sodium hydroxide. Now it reacts with them to form solutions. So that's all they just needed to do, reacting with, with an acid, reacting with a base. That means we want to see um, that scandium can behave like an acid and scandium can behave like a base. That is what it means by amphoteric. Hello, did you get what I said, please? Okay. Yes. Okay. That scandium can react with an acid and also react with a base. Yes, please. Um, the next one is um, coming. What's the next question? You said number four, right? Yes. Number four. The soluble salt hydrated lithium sulfate is made by titration. Oh, that's that brings us to titration. Oh, we've not done titration. Sorry. Um, oh, no, no, no. This is going to take me to titration. Don't worry, let's leave that until we consider titration. Let's do, we're going to do titration later on. Not now. Not now. Please tell me another one. I understand if you can't do that. That's titration. Number five. Number five. Number five. Oh, this is acid base. Well, I think we just have to treat some of these things as they come right now. Okay, number five. Let's see what is there. Um, to find it, ammonia is a compound which contains only the element of nitrogen and hydrogen. It's a weak base, yes. Define the term base, okay. It's a substance which reacts with acid to produce salt and water ions only. Given a cure solution of ammonia and sodium hydroxide, both having a concentration of um, 0 0.1 mole per dm cube, how would you show that ammonium is the weaker beans? Yeah. Uh, I think I think we have a. Um, Let's see, we, we have a lot, we have lots of questions. Uh, I think what I'll do is, this is, this is a blend of um, different topics. I didn't even know that. I felt it was only periodic, don't worry, I understand. This is, this is, uh, this is a calculation in acid base, acid base. All right. Let's see the ones you couldn't do. You said number three, number four. Don't worry, we've done number three. Number four, number four is um, titration. Number five, number five is um, number acid, six. acid and base. Number six, number six is, sorry. Um, even number five, we still have um, organic chemistry, okay. Okay, okay, pH. Okay, number six. All right, 
Number six is also organic chemistry. All right. Germanium is an element in group seven. The electron distribution of a germanium atom is this, this has a station state. The germanium forms a series of saturated hydrides. When we say they are saturated, meaning that um, they are complete, similar to alkenes. Draw the structural formula of the hydride, which contains germanium atoms per molecule. Okay. And this is organic chemistry, number six. Number six, now, this is quite simple. Um, now, this is what we'll do. Let me see if I could share my screen so you know. Have you done organic chemistry? Yes, okay. only hydrocarbons. Sorry? Only hydrocarbons. Okay, only hydrocarbon. All right. But you know alkenes, alkenes, right? Yeah, no. Al yes, alkene. Okay, we know this is the formula for alkene. Germanium said it's three. Um, so we'll just say a normal one has a CH3. That's for anyone having three carbon atom, CH2 and CH3. So for germanium, it's going to be G E H3, G E H2, and then G E. H3. So we can draw the formula just H. You can draw the, you can draw the formula of such like that. GE, then having three H hydrogen hydrogen atoms, then GE having two. Yeah, just like this, since the two is similar to alkenes, similar to alkenes. So that is it. Now they said predict the general formula of the germanium predicts the general formula of the germanium hydride. Since it's um, similar to alkenes, that is a quite simple. Germanium hydride becomes, um, instead of C, anywhere we see C, we put GE. That becomes G, E, H, 2, N, plus 2. Do you understand what I'm doing, please? Yes. All right, so that's just the answer. GEH2M plus two. The next question was um, let's see. Okay. Draw a diagram showing the arrangement of the valency electrons in one molecule of a covalent compound, um, germanium 4 chloride. This is very simple. I'm, I'm going to leave you to do this. Um, GeLCl4, GeCl4. Come on, that's quite easy. Remember, CCl4, tetrachloro4, that's tetrachloromethane. Tetrachloromethane. That's when we're talking about the substitution of. Um, Chlorination of methane molecule, chlorination of methane. So, if they act once, if you are asked to draw this in the normal one, we're having Cl, then we have Cl, Cl, Cl. So, they are asking something similar to that. Something similar. They said, draw a diagram showing the arrangement of the valency electron in one molecule of the covalent compound, German, germanium four. Chloride, germanium four chloride, germanium four chloride. That is just GE. Then we are having um, sorry for that. We are having Cl. Then we are having another one Cl. We are having Cl. Then we are having Cl here. OK, 
Okay. Use zero to represent an electron from chlorine atom, that's zero. And then use X to represent an electron from germanium atom. Describe the structure of the giant covalent compound germanium four oxide. Um, let me see. Okay. It has a similar structure to that of silicon. Silicon four oxide. All we just see is four oxygen atoms around each um, germanium atom and two germanium atom around each oxygen atom, which is um, a tetrahedral shape, giving us a tetrahedral shape. So the four oxygen atom around each germanium atom. Um, let me see. It's gonna be giving us a four oxygen atom. Where is it now? Okay. We're going to be having four, describe the structure of a giant covalent molecule. That means we'll be having four oxygen atom around a germanium, around a germanium atom. And then we'll be having two germanium atom around each oxygen atom. And the shape is going to be a tetrahedral shape. It's going to be a tetrahedral shape like, um, like a methane molecule. Is the change GeCl2 to GeCl4 reduction, oxidation, or neither? Give a reason for your choice. Give a reason for your choice. Now, what we do, what we understand about oxidation is um, Cl2 to Cl4, it is actually oxidation now the question now is this why is it oxidation why do we say that is oxidation oxidation we know is uh, the loss of electron oxidation we know is a um, loss of elect electron and also increase in oxidation number and we saw from there that cl the oxidation the cl increased from oxidation number of two to four. So that is oxidation. That is oxidation. So is the change oxidation or reduction? That is oxidation because oxidation is increasing oxidation number. G increased from C, it increased. And that's um, two, it increased to four. So do you understand what I've done please? Or what I've said? Mm. Sorry? No. Okay. Let's do this. Come here. Um, wow, well, we are, all these topics, we are really need to consider them in, in uh, we really need to consider these topics separately. They are real separate, huge topics. Now this is GCL2. We know for anything to have this, that means that um, GE was originally having that too, right? You know, um, before an electron can have like this, we have what we call the swaps and drops method. This is actually two and this is one. So GE took the place of one, CL took the place of two. So when you write them, it becomes G E C L two. You understand how I did this, right? G E C L two, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, the oxidation number of G E here is actually two. Now, the oxidation number of G E here for C L four is actually four. And one of the definition of oxidation is this: oxidation is increase in oxidation number. Increase in oxidation number. So when there's an increase in oxidation number, that means we, say, we know that oxidation had occurred. And when there's a decrease in oxidation number, we know that reduction had occurred. So that's one of the reasons why we say that is oxidation. That's why we say that is oxidation. Okay, um, I think 
I should stop these questions. So that let's learn something for today. Yeah, sorry, you said um, four, five, and what? Six and what? Seven. Seven, okay. Seven is the second part. Sorry, okay, seven is for the second part. Yes, B. Okay, that's the fully methods and other reactivity. Is that what you, is that it? Yes. The fulling metals, where are they? I know the reactivity, potassium, zinc, copper. For those metals which react with water or steam, name the product of the reaction, otherwise, write no reaction. For those which react with water, okay, potassium. Now, that's very simple. Come on. Um, potassium reacting with water gives us what? Um, where is it? Where, 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 where? Okay, I think I will share my screen. Okay, potassium reacting with water gives us potassium hydroxide, which is KOH plus hydrogen. So you just balance the equation. So potassium reaction with water giving us um, KOH, potassium hydroxide um, plus hydrogen. Now the next one is um, zinc. Zinc reacting with that gives us, with water gives us zinc oxide. Zinc oxide plus hydrogen. When we react to zinc, Okay, yeah, we just come on, try and sort some it. H2, and that gives us um, ZNO. Zinc oxide plus um, hydrogen. Okay, and the last one is copper. Copper, copper is not going to react because copper cannot displace hydrogen. I mean, hydrogen is higher than copper in the activity series. So um, copper, no reaction, no reaction. All right, I guess, um, sorry, please remember to balance these equations. I, I, I don't think they are, they are balanced. We have um, two, we have three here. So if we have two here now, That'll be four, two. So if we have, um, this is still not balanced. Probably let's have three here. That'll be six. And if we have two here, if we have, um, let's see. How do we balance this now? We have four here, this becomes um, eight, four. And then, um, here, um, four times two, eight, okay. So we have four here, let's look at this having, we have four here, um, we have four here, hydrogen is four, um, that means, so, in the last one. so this would be two, so it's balanced now. Okay, ZNO, H2 is O. ZN, if we have, if we have, sorry, please hold on. Yeah. Okay, so how do we balance ZN plus H2? ZN plus H2O, okay. This is balanced. Yeah, you say what? It's balanced. Balanced, correct. So that is it. So uh, I think that's all for now. Um, I think do you, you do that questions. Do that questions, like I said, are under when we get to those topics, we will treat them. We, I think before we leave, we should, before we that's probably next time we we'll meet again 
in chemistry, we should be treating um, titration and uh, we should be treating acid, beads, and salt so that we can treat those, those kind of questions and then we'll treat titration and stoichiometry. Okay. Um, with this now, uh, I want, want to treat something very important today that's um, chemical energetics, chemical reactions. And it's quite very lengthy. That's over three or four weeks topics. But I believe we can, uh, I'm going to take it very slowly and um, we should be able to get to a very, 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 very awesome area. Okay, let's treat the um, chemical reactions. Let's start with that, chemical reactions, chemical reactions. We're going to be doing lots of writing because it has to do with explanations, chemical reactions. Now, the first thing we should understand is um, what are chemical reactions? Chemical reactions, actually, um, we know they can be represented involving formulas and symbols. So the first thing you need to define is um, what's a reaction rate? Now, please write, reaction rate. This is the total time taken for a particular reaction to take place. Sorry, reaction time, sorry, reaction time. That's reaction time I'm defining. Reaction time. This is the total time taken for a particular reaction to take place. That means one of the reaction is um, if I want to boil my rice, I know definitely I'm boiling the rice for um, 45 minutes. Okay, the time taken for me to boil that rice is called the reaction time. Reaction time. So what is reaction rate? Please write that. This is the number of moles of reactions. This is the number of moles of reactions converted. This is the number of moles of reaction converted or product formed, or product formed per unit time, or product formed per unit time, or product formed per unit time. And it, um, the unit is a uh, mole per dm cube per second. Mole per dm cube. Mole <coughs> per dm cube per second. Okay. Okay. Now, um, one thing now, I want to explain something. Um, in all reactions, actually, for a particular reaction to occur, there's something we call existing bond in the reactant particle must actually be broken down first before new bonds, before new bonds can be formed to form a product. One of the first things to happen is when a reaction is taking place, the reactant bonds are broken down for new bonds to be formed or new products to be formed. Now, the breaking of these bonds actually require energy. And that is why, um, the initial energy is required to activate the reactant particle. Now this reaction or this energy is called what we call the activation energy. So that brings us to what you call activation energy. What is activation energy? Please write this down. Activation energy is the minimum amount of energy required. The minimum amount of energy required the minimum amount of energy required for a reaction to take place. The minimum amount of energy required for a particular reaction to take place. The minimum amount of energy required but now, one thing we must also understand is when this activation is, is acquired, when this activation energy is acquired by reactant particles, they form what we call a complex 
particles of high energy content. And most times this is called um, activated complex. Now, that brings us to what we call, um, let's look at some of the factors. Oh, should we go to factors? Okay, that brings us to what we call collision theory. There are many things about collision theory. Now, collision theory number one states uh, introduction to collision theory. Collision theory was actually developed from a um, kinetic theory of gases. And that is the kinetic theory of gases uh, to account for the influence of concentration. All right, take care. Now the theory is actually based on this. Number one, that reaction occur as a result of the collision of reactant particles. Number one, one of the collision theory, it states that reaction only occur, please write that, reaction only occurs as a result of collision of reactant particles. Reactions only occur as a result of collision of reactant particles. Reaction occurs as a result of collision of reactant. I'm going to explain that now. See, um, if I really want, um, maybe, okay, I think I have, I have a video that explains that. I have a video that I was going to explain that, but before that, sorry, hold on. Send me chats about this. Thank you. Now, reactions occur. Now, um, what, what I'm trying to say is reaction occurs as a result of collision. If, don't worry, let me don't explain that. Uh, we, we, we'll see that in the video that I'm going to show you later on. Number two, a reaction results only if collision attains certain minimum energy. Reaction, reaction. reaction results only if collision attains a certain minimum energy. Reaction results only if collision attains a certain minimum energy. And what is that minimum energy called? Activation energy. Now, what we're trying to say is, um, until activation energy has been attained or overcome, reaction cannot occur. Until activation energy has been overcome, there can be no reaction. That's what we're trying to say. The third thing is this. The third thing I want to explain is um, collision will not give rise to a reaction. Collision can you hear me? No, factors affecting the rate of chemical reaction. Factors affecting the... Uh, factors affecting the rate of chemical reaction. Number one is the nature of reactants. The nature of reactants. I, I, I want to ask you this question. Um, if ion, zinc, and gold metals are placed in a different beaker continually, um, with hydrochloric acid. What we will see is something that um, there will be rapid evolution in the beaker containing acid and zinc metal. But what if, but what if um, we used a dilute acid? What do you think will happen to the zinc metal? Would, would there be faster evolution of hydrogen gas or slower evolution of hydrogen gas? Slower. Sorry? Faster. That, that's if we use a dilute or acid. Now, this is it. We have a zinc metal. We have a um, slower. Okay, slower, good. Slower. Because we have a um, concentrated acid. With concentrated acid, there will be a fast evolution of hydrogen gas. But if we have um, a dilute acid, it's going to take time. Like, seriously, we're going to take lots of time. Oh, but let's forget the thing now. Let's assume we have a um, 
gold metal and acid do you think there will be evolution of hydrogen gas no why eh Yeah, why did you say no? I don't know. The good metal will you. The good metal will what? Hello? Yes. Yeah, you said a good metal will what? If you yeah. react, if you react with an acid, there will be. Okay, let's save ourselves time. A good metal actually will not produce hydrogen gas. Remember, um, there will be no reaction. There will be no. There will be no reaction because gold is actually the lowest metal in the activity series. So gold itself cannot displace hydrogen. So gold is actually. You see now that the nature of the reactant actually affects um, rate of chemical reaction. Now, number two, the next thing is effect of concentration. Effects of concentration. Effects of concentration. Now, I want to ask, I want to see something. I want to ask you something. Now, now if reactant particles are crowded in a particular place, if reactant particles are crowded in a particular place, their frequency of collision will it be faster or slower? Faster. Faster. Now, what does this mean? This means that the concentration of a reactant, please write this down, write this down. The more the concentration of reactant particles, the higher the rate of reaction. The more the concentration of reactant particles, the higher the rate of reaction. That means if we have a, if we have a more concentrated solution, more concentrated acid will react faster. We react faster on probably on a human body than dilute acid. So the more the concentration of reactant particles the higher the rates of reaction, the higher the rates of reaction. But we must note something about pressure. Please write this. Pressure affects only the concentration of gaseous reactants. Pressure affects only the concentration of gaseous reactants. Now, this means This means that the higher the, please write this down also, the higher the pressure of gaseous reactants, the higher the pressure of gaseous reactants, the higher the rate of reaction. The higher the rates of reaction. This is awesome, this is awesome. Pressure does not affect solid, please note that down, pressure does not affect solid. One of the most um, confusing questions they normally set in um, um, WIAC questions are, they will give you a reaction and um, 
they will give you in um, in gaseous form and they will give you in solid form. And guess the confusing question they will ask you: What is the effect of pressure? Come on, the effect of pressure in solid system, pressure has no effect. But in a gaseous system, uh, there, there, there are techniques to know the effect of pressure on gaseous system. I'm going to be showing you right there in a, in a video very soon. But let's complete this um, aspect because I have lots of questions on this. Okay, number three, effects of surface area of the reactants. Effects of surface area of the reactants. Effect of surface area. Now, what? how do we use to understand surface area? Um, um, this is it. This, this is, um, I just want to, I just, I just want to say this. Um, if if um, you take if you take a marble if you take a marble um, you maybe you want to boil a marble and another form maybe a zinc marble is you know a zinc marble is solid right yes now and when we there's some the difference between a zinc marble and a granulated marble a granulated marble is the one that has been smashed sorry a granulated zinc it has been smashed now if you take those two things and react it which one would have a longer reaction time and which one will have a faster reaction time you can the granulated the granulated why because it's less dense. Ah, okay, it's less dense. Awesome, awesome. Now, the same thing also. You want to cook your indomie. Do not smash the indomie. Do not smash it. And the other parts, the other indomie you want to do, you smash it. So if you take the other indomie and smash it, and you take the other one that you did not smash, you just put it in... You just put it straight up. You just put it straight. You just put it straight. You just put it straight. You will notice that the one that has been smashed will boil faster. So that is what we call the effect of surface area of the reactant. Please write this down. The more exposed the area of contact, the more exposed the area of contact of reacting particles, the more exposed the area of contact of reacting particles to each other, the more exposed the area of contact of reacting particles to each other, the faster the rates of chemical reaction, the faster the rate of reaction, the faster the rates of reaction, the more exposed the area of contact of reacting particles to each other, the faster the rate of reaction. So that means that for solid reactants, the exposed area must be, in, how do you increase the ex, uh, surface area of a solid particles by breaking it together. When you break the solid into smaller pieces, what are you doing? You are increasing the, you are increasing the surface area. Okay, number four. Number four, let's look at, the effect of temperature, effect of temperature, effect of temperature. Please write this down. The higher the temperature, the higher the rate of reaction. The higher the effect, the higher the temperature, the higher the rate of reaction. The higher the temperature, the higher the rates of reaction. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, now we're gonna come Hello, are you there? Yes. 
So in this code, I think it's like a Hello. Hello, are you there? Hello. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Um yes. Okay, let's look at let's look at this. Um if the effect of light. Effect of light. Effect of light. Now we know definitely that there are some reactions that are photo, we call them photochemical reactions. Photochemical reactions. What we, these ones are affected by light. An example of photochemical react. That is why most um, chemicals are placed in amber bottles. They are placed in amber bottles because of the lights. So an example of such reactions are decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide bottles are kept in amber bottles, not in um, silver bottles. Why? Because of um, light, they are light sensitive. Another one, again, it's, um, uh, you see um, silver, silver um, nitrates, are mis um, silver nitrate solutions are placed in amber bottles because of when they are placed in uh, silver itself is light sensitive. The conversion of silver halide to gray metallic silver gives you um, is is most times affected by light. So, and the last one we'll be looking at again is um, effect of catalyst. Effect of catalyst. Please write this. What now? What is a catalyst? A catalyst is a substance that alters, not speed up, not speed down, not speed up the rate of chemical reaction because there are some catalysts that. Um, speed down the rate of chemical reaction. So the best word to write is an alter and a, a catalyst is a substance that alters the rate of chemical reactions, but itself does not undergo any permanent change. A catalyst is a substance that alters the rate of chemical reaction, but itself does not undergo any permanent change at the end of the reaction. Now, what does a catalyst do? The catalyst, they lower the activation energy. Please write that, that is very, very important. They lower the activation energy of reactant particles. They lower the activation energy of reactant particles. This is an example. Um, let me do a drawing, a drawing, a drawing. This is an example of what a catalyst does. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Now, um, if this, um, I don't know, if, now this is, now this is reactant. This is product. Okay. What a catalyst simply does is a catalyst, this is the from here to here. From here to here is what we call the activation energy. So what a catalyst simply does is it low, oh sorry. The catalyst just uh, come on. that's too much the catalyst just lowers the chemical um sorry lower the activation energy so instead of the instead of it um, taking longer time it just lowers the activation energy for a reaction to take place so that's the effect of a catalyst it lowers the activation energy of a reactant particles by providing a more alternative way so that more reactant particles can collide all right, before we go into endothermic and exothermic reactions, um, I think I have just have something to just show you. Let's look at um, factors, factors affecting, let's look at two things. Factors affecting rates of chemical reaction. Hello and welcome to guests. Okay. Uh, 
I'm coming. Let me get the video out. In today's video, pleasure. Moving faster, we want to do the you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time during our weather nap. Sorry. Um, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, we should be saying. Yes. Happy you. Coming. The other important thing. Okay. When, when the students come, I will ask them. Sorry? When they come, I will ask them. I don't know. Yeah. When we have a class. Yeah. Okay. The more energy they have, the more energy they can transfer during the collision. And so the more likely they are to surpass that minimum activation energy. The other important thing is the frequency of the collisions, which just means how often the particles fly with each other. So let's list. Before we can understand how these factors affect the rate though, we need to cover the theory behind reactions which is known as collision theory. This states that in order for particles to react, they have to collide with each other with sufficient energy, which we call the activation energy. And if they collide with less energy than this, then nothing will happen. They will just bounce apart together. So if you to think about an entire reaction, which will involve tons of particles, then the rate at any particular point is going to depend on two main things. The most obvious is the amount of energy that the particles have. The more energy they have, the more energy they can transfer during the collision, and so the more likely they are to surpass that minimum activation energy. The other important thing is the frequency of the collisions, which just means how often the particles collide with each other. So even though not all collisions are successful, because the particles involved don't always reach activation energy. The more often they collide, the more successful collisions they'll be overall. Now, whenever you think about how these four factors affect the rate of reaction, you always want to think in terms of how they affect the amount of energy that the particles have, and the frequency of the collisions. And increasing either of these will increase the rate of reaction by increasing the number of successful collisions. Let's start with temperature. As the temperature of a reaction increases, the particles gain more energy, which means that they move faster. And because they're moving faster, they collide more frequently. They'll also collide with more energy each time, so are more likely to exceed the activation energy. So overall, there will be a higher rate of successful collisions, and thus a higher rate of reaction. Okay. Now, concentration and pressure are normally considered as a single factor because they both refer to how many particles there are per unit of volume. It's just that concentration generally refers to solutions and pressure refers to gases. When either of these is increased, it means that there'll be more particles per unit of volume, which makes the collisions more frequent. And so it increases the rate of reaction. Yes, I for students. Just like concentration and pressure, a higher surface area will also increase the rate of reaction. For example, if we wanted to react three grams of magnesium with an acid, we could use a solid block of magnesium, small chunks of magnesium, or powder. As all of these have the same mass and volume, the powdered form would have the highest surface area to volume ratio. And so we have a much higher area over which collisions with the other reactants, in this case the acid, can take place. Meaning that the frequency of the collisions would be higher, leading to a higher rate of reaction. 
The last factor that we need to cover is the presence of a catalyst. Catalysts are substances that speed up a reaction without being used up in the reaction themselves. So we don't include them in the reaction equation as they're not reactant or products. Yes, I do. To understand how they work, we can use a reaction profile, which shows the change in the chemical's energy during a reaction. Now, this distance between the reactant's energy level and the very top of the curve is the activation energy, which, remember, is the energy that the collisions have to have before they can react successfully. What a catalyst does is lowers this activation energy by providing an alternative reaction pathway. And this means that there'll be a higher proportion of successful collisions. The word catalyst is actually a pretty broad term, and a whole range of different substances can act as catalysts in different situations. One of the most common sources of catalysts, though, are the transition metals, like cobalt and nickel. And if you do biology, you'll have come across them in the form of enzymes, which are just catalysts made by living organisms. Okay, um, I believe you understand you've, you understand that now. So let's go into what we call endothermic and exothermic reactions. Endothermic and um, exothermic reactions. Uh, that's where we have um, chemical energetics. Endothermic and exothermic reactions. So that's these are types of chemical reactions. So what's an endothermic reaction? An endothermic reaction, please write this down. An endothermic reaction is one during which heat is absorbed from the surrounding. An endothermic reaction is one in which heat is absorbed from the surrounding. Now, um, example of um, endothermic reactions are most decomposition processes. That means decomposition processes, what I mean, um, dissolving of, uh, that's dissolution of ammonium chloride. These are endothermic reactions. So an endothermic reaction is the one in which heat is absorbed from the surrounding. That is endothermic reaction. And one of the things to note about endothermic reaction is this. One of the things to note about endothermic reaction is that, um, the enthalpy of products, that means delta H, is greater than that of reactants. Delta H is greater than, the, that's the enthalpy of products is greater than the enthalpy of reactants. The enthalpy of products is greater than the enthalpy of reactants. All right? So that means we are having a delta H is equals to the sum of the product, sum of the products minus the sum of the heat of the reactants. That means we are having a delta H is equal to the sum of the heat of products minus the sum of the heat of reactants. Okay, what I, what I would trying to say, what we are trying to say is um, delta H is equal to the sum of the heat of products minus the sum of the heat of reactants. Another thing we know about an um, endothermic reaction is that um, delta H is always positive. It's always positive. It's always positive. Very important. Delta H is always positive. Sorry about that. Delta H is always positive positive. Okay, this is how we know that a reaction is an endothermic reaction. Remember, like we said, that um, in the one of the things we said about endothermic reaction is that um, the we, we said something about endothermic reaction is that the, the, the product is always higher than that of the reactant. So if you are drawing the the diagram for that. Um, sorry, let me get the diagram. If you're drawing the diagram for that, that means you'll be having, you should be having something of this nature. You should be having something of this nature. 
this standing as the product and then standing as the reactant so we can put it as the product sorry you can see it like that and some persons would always have a that means we can have this as the product and then we can have this as the reactant now so this represents the activation energy the activation energy so this is the product so we we've, we've gotten to establish that fact for endothermic reaction now let's just discuss exothermic reaction exothermic reaction this is one in which heat is released to the surrounding this is one in which heat <coughs> this is one in which heat is released to the surroundings so what are the examples of exothermic reaction we have combustion combustion now exothermic reactions are always accompanied by great amount of heat being released to the surrounding so we have um, the combustion reaction we have a um, dissolution of um, tetrazo sulfate 6 acid sodium hydroxide potassium hydroxide these ones they are accompanied with great release of heat so one, one of the things we know about exothermic reaction is um, the enthalpy of products is less than that of the reactant. Please write this, write that down. The enthalpy of products, the enthalpy of products is less than that of reactant. The enthalpy of products is less than that of the reactant. The enthalpy of products is lesser than that of reactants. So because of that, because of that, uh, normally we see our reactants here and our products coming below. So this becomes reactants and this becomes the product. So this is exothermic. And in this case, delta H is always negative. Please write that down, delta H is always negative delta h is always negative okay now the we should really note that um the uh, what they call it the um the plus and minus signs indicate that differently okay if having understood this part um, can we take a question? Okay, we, I think we still have one more thing to do before we go into chemical equilibrium. That is where we have more questions. More questions. More questions coming in. Um, 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 um. Okay. Um, can I see? Okay, let's just go into chemical, I'm coming to have a question here. Um, don't worry. Most of the things we'll do now. Now, what we'll be talking about chemical equilibrium. And this is, um, this is the most interesting aspect, chemical equilibrium. Now, for we to understand chemical equilibrium, we must know which reaction is reversible and which reaction is irreversible. Now, when we talk about react, uh, reversible reaction, we know if it can be made to go forward and backward under a given set of conditions. That means a reversible reaction is a reaction in which it can be made to proceed forward and backward. We have many reactions like that. For example, water. Water, you can, water, you can from water liquid, we can get gaseous water that's uh, water in the gas state, and then come back to work, getting water in the liquid state. For ex another example is ammonia. Ammonia can be, you can get ammonia in the forward states, 
and you can also get ammonia, you can also get nitrogen and hydrogen in the backward state. So these reactions are said to be reversible reactions. I know, I hope you've heard of such word before, right? Hello, I hope you've heard of such words before. Yes. Okay. Uh, I know you've heard of that before. That's why I'm not really taking time to go through that. So we know this is such kinds of reaction. We have um, NH3, okay. Now, um, so this sign alone represents reversible reaction. And if it doesn't have the sign, it is called an irreversible reaction. So dynamic equilibrium. Now, how do we know now for, for this now, when the rates of forward and backward reaction in irreversible reactions are equal, the reaction is said to be at equilibrium. Please write that down, very important. When the rates of forward and backward reactions when the rates of forward and backward reactions in a reversible reaction are equal, the reaction is said to be at equilibrium. The reaction is said to be at equilibrium. Okay. Have you written that down, please? Yes. Okay. Now, what are the characteristics of, um, or what are the properties of a system at equilibrium? Let's look at properties of a system at equilibrium. Properties of a system at equilibrium. Number one. One of the properties of a system at equilibrium, number one, is that equilibrium is dynamic. Equilibrium is dynamic. That means what we are trying to say is that equilibrium can be achieved from either direction, can be achieved from either the forward reaction or the backward reaction. That's what we mean, equilibrium is dynamic. Equilibrium is dynamic. Number two, the rates of the forward and backward reactions are equal. The rates of the forward reaction and backward reactions are equal. The rates of the forward and backward reactions are equal. And something very, very important is this. Equilibrium position is not affected by the presence of a catalyst. Equilibrium position is not affected, man, that is very important. Equilibrium position is not affected by the presence of a catalyst. Rather, it only quickens the rate at which equilibrium is achieved. It only quickens the rate at which equilibrium is achieved. It only quickens the rate at which equilibrium is achieved. Okay. Um, number four, at equilibrium, the free energy change, that's a delta G, at equilibrium, the free energy change is zero. At equilibrium, the free energy change is zero. And the, and the other thing we'll be talking about is any system at equilibrium will resist the change. Any system at equilibrium will resist the change. An example is, an example of such thing I want to use is um, if you are relaxing somewhere, you wouldn't want anybody to disturb you. That is just it. So any system at equilibrium will resist a change. Okay. This brings us to what we call the Le Chatelier's principle. 
Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, but before we continue, um, let's just see something on dynamic equilibrium. Let's just see something, um, video, I guess I have a video on dynamic equilibrium. Okay. Still Chatelier. Sorry? What did you say? Still Chakilia. Okay. Um, let me send Still Chakilia. I'm coming. I just sent it to you. Le Chakilia's principle. Have you seen it, please? Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's just see something on dynamic equilibrium before um we go into Le Chatelier's principle. In this lesson, you will learn about dynamic equilibrium, the conditions required for dynamic equilibrium to be reached, and examples of systems at equilibrium. Imagine you are digging a hole. You got it? Imagine as you are digging that hole, your friend is refilling it. If you are digging the hole faster than your friend, the hole gets larger. If your friend is filling the hole faster than you, the hole gets smaller. But if the two of you are working at the same speed, there would be no change to the size of the hole. The same concept can be applied to a reversible reaction. If the rate of the forward reaction, reactants to products, is the same as the reverse reaction, products to reactants, the reaction is said to be at equilibrium. This is called a dynamic equilibrium because both processes are occurring simultaneously, even though there is no overall observable change. For a chemical system, such as a reaction or phase change to be at equilibrium, it must meet two important criteria. First, it must be a reversible process. Second, it must be taking place in a closed system. A closed system is one where there is no exchange of matter, only exchange of energy. An example of a reaction at equilibrium is the reaction of hydrogen and iodine in a closed container to produce hydrogen iodide. At the start of the reaction, there is a high concentration of hydrogen and iodine, and the concentrations decrease as hydrogen iodide is formed. The concentration of hydrogen iodide increases as the forward reaction proceeds. As hydrogen iodide is formed, the reverse reaction is then able to occur. Over time, the concentrations of hydrogen, iodine, and hydrogen iodide remain constant. So what is happening here? The reaction of hydrogen and iodine to produce hydrogen iodide is occurring at the same rate as the decomposition of hydrogen iodide to hydrogen and iodine. So there are no observable changes, although both the forward and reverse reactions are occurring. This reaction has not stopped, but rather has reached dynamic equilibrium. What would happen to this reaction if the lid on top of the glass jar was opened? Please pause the lesson to think about this and resume when you are done. If the lid was removed, the system is no longer at equilibrium as the reactants and products or matter would be able to escape the system. Liquid bromine equilibrates to form gaseous bromine at room temperature. Remember that this is not a reaction, but rather a phase change. Phase changes can also reach equilibrium under the correct conditions. As liquid bromine evaporates, gaseous bromine condenses. Since these two processes are occurring simultaneously at the same rate, there is no observable macroscopic change, but the system is in fact in dynamic equilibrium. 
In summary, a chemical system is said to be at equilibrium when the rate of the forward reaction is the same as the rate of the reverse reaction. There are no observable changes, but both directions of the reaction are occurring, so it is a dynamic equilibrium. Okay, so awesome. That's um, that's just something. Now let's talk to let's talk about Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle. Okay. <clears throat> now Le Chatelier's principle states that if an external constraint, if an external constraint such as change in temperature, comma pressure or concentration is imposed on a chemical system in equilibrium. I said Le Chatelier's principle states that if an external constraint, such as change in temperature, pressure, or concentration is imposed on a chemical system in equilibrium, the equilibrium will shift so as to neutralize that constraint the equilibrium will shift so as to neutralize that constraint. That means, in summary, what I'm just trying to say is that if a system in equilibrium is stressed, the equilibrium will shift so as to neutralize that stress. The equilibrium will shift The equilibrium will shift so as to neutralize that stress. That is just simple. Now, um, we're going to look at factors affecting equilibrium of chemical reaction. This is now the main part. Factors affecting equilibrium position. This is very, very important. This is actually the main thing. This is where we have lots of questions coming out from factors affecting equilibrium of a chemical reaction. Okay, one of the first factors we'll be looking at is, um, let me see which one should we look at. Okay, 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 okay. Um, before we continue, I think I still have, um, okay. Before we continue, should I explain first? Let's just look at one video before we do that. In this lesson, you will learn about- I'm coming. Let's see. Let's see this video first before I explain it. The Chatelier's principle, which explains what a system at equilibrium does in response to stresses. Let's return to our original example of you digging a hole and your friend refilling it simultaneously. If you start digging at a rate faster than refilling, the hole gets larger. In order to maintain a constant size of the hole, your friend must work harder to fill it faster. Following on the same idea, when a chemical system at equilibrium is stressed, the system works to restore equilibrium. This is Le Chatelier's principle. The stresses are changes to the concentration of either the reactants or products, changes to the pressure, although this is only applicable to gaseous systems, changes to the temperature. Let's examine a hypothetical reversible reaction at equilibrium where reactant A reacts with reactant B to form product C and product D. If we added more A and B, the system becomes stressed and is no longer at equilibrium. To counteract the stress, the system forms more C and D in order to remove the excess A and B. Okay, this is a very important point. So the first thing we'll be looking at is effect of concentration. Please write that down. Effect of concentration now please write this down very important 
if the concentration of any of the reactants is increased, if the concentration of any of the reactants is increased, the equilibrium will shift to the right. The equilibrium will shift to the right. But if it is decreased, it will shift to the left. But if it is decreased, it will shift to the left. Let's go back to our videos again, our video again. Okay, so this is exactly what you just watched here now that um, we just saw that this system was stressed. At this point, the system was stressed. So what happened? Because we had more concentration in the reactant, the equilibrium shifted or the equilibrium shifts to the right to restore that stress. Forms more C and D in order to remove the excess A and B. The equilibrium therefore shifts to the right. Now it shifts to the right, that means it favors the forward reaction. It favors the forward reaction, okay. If we added more C and D, the system becomes stressed and is also no longer at equilibrium. So to counteract stress, the system forms more A and B. Therefore, the equilibrium shifts to the left. What happens if we remove C and D as they are being produced, or if the concentration of C and D is decreased? Please pause the lesson to think about this and resume when you are done. Okay, so can you answer that question? What happens if we have, uh, we keep, what, happen, what happens if we remove more products? Where do you think the equilibrium will shift to? Or which reaction, which reaction will be favored? Yes. Sorry? Shift to the left. And Why? The right -hand side. Why? Because the product was reduced. Now, do you think it was going to, do you think it's going to shift to the reactant? Yes. Now, now, what I mean is the equilibrium position, where will it shift to, to counteract that stress? Oh, to the right. Awesome. Why do you think it will shift to the right now? To balance the, the reaction. Awesome, just to balance it. To make it, to get an equilibrium. Simple, to get an equilibrium. So that means if, now that the product is being removed, equilibrium positions shifts back to the right to counteract that stress that was, that's already on the left-hand side. So let's continue now. The system is now stressed and no longer at equilibrium. To counteract the stress, more C and D are produced, so equilibrium shifts to the right. When concentration increases, Equilibrium shifts to the opposite side of the reaction. Please write that part. When concentration, when concentration increases, equilibrium shifts to the opposite side of the reaction. When concentration increases, equilibrium shifts to the opposite side of the reaction. When concentration increases, equilibrium shifts to the opposite side of the reaction. When concentration decreases, equilibrium shifts to the same side of the reaction. Please write that. When concentration decreases, equilibrium shifts to the same side. When concentration decreases, equilibrium shifts to the same side of the reaction. changes in pressure. 
Okay, number two, let's talk about that. Changes in pressure or change in pressure. Change in pressure. Remember what I told you about pressure, that for change in pressure to affect the chemical system in equilibrium, one of the things is that it must be a gaseous system. Pressure, it, for, one, for, for pressure to be affected, or for pressure to affect a chemical system at equilibrium, number one is that it must be a gaseous system. And number two is that the total number of gaseous molecules on the left-hand side must be different from the total number of molecules on the right-hand side. Now, you are gonna, we are going to see that in the video now. The stress to a system at equilibrium is only applicable to gaseous systems. For this stress, we will examine another hypothetical reaction at equilibrium, where reactant A reacts with two moles of reactant B to form product C and product D. An increase in pressure means that there is a decrease in volume, so there is less space. Equilibrium will shift to the side of the reaction with fewer moles. Please write that. Equilibrium will shift to the side of the reaction with fewer moles. Equilibrium will shift to the side of the reaction with fewer moles. I hope you know that there's a relationship between pressure and volume, which is an inverse relationship. That means when there's an increase in pressure, there's a decrease in volume, right? Yes. And when there's a decrease in pressure, there's an increase in volume. So equilibrium will shift to the side of the reaction with fewer moles. In our example, an increase in pressure will cause equilibrium to shift to the right since there are fewer moles two moles compared to three moles on the left. A decrease in pressure means that there is an increase in volume, so there is more space. Equilibrium shifts to the side with more moles. So in our example, equilibrium shifts to the left. So an increase in pressure favors the side with fewer moles and a decrease in pressure favors the side with more moles. Please write this down, an increase in pressure favors the side with fewer moles, and a decrease in pressure favors the side with more moles. Please write that down. It's fewer moles. Sorry? Hello, okay. What did you say, please? Hello. I didn't get that. Hey, don't worry, it's on the screen. Okay. Don't worry. Okay. Now let's go to the last one. In our next lesson, you will learn about how a system works to restore equilibrium in response to changes in temperature. In summary, Le Chatelier's principle states that when a system at equilibrium is stressed, the system works to restore equilibrium. Okay, let's see a question. Let's see a question. I want to bring out some... Um, Let's see, question. Okay. Um, come in please.
Okay, let's see one of these questions I have here. Um, Um, where is my share screen? Okay. Okay, can you see this question? Now, this no. is a worksheet. Okay, now, um, look at this question. Complete the following chart by writing left, right, none, or equilibrium shift, decreases or remains the same. For the concentration of reactants. Now, that is the question. Where would equilibrium shift to when you add more H2? When you add more hydrogen? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so where would equilibrium shift to at this point? You add more hydrogen. Sorry? If you add more hydrogen, right? Yeah, if we add hydrogen, more hydrogen here. Shift to the Now this is this is actually the effect shift of constant. Good, good. It so shifts to the right. Okay. So what happens to the um, if it shifts to the right? What happens to the concentration of nitrogen? Does it increase or decrease? The second one, N2. Yes, yes. What happens when you add this? You say equilibrium shifts to the right. So what happens to the concentration of nitrogen? Does it increase or decrease? It decreases. It decreases also. Um, okay. H2, it's okay. What happens to, what happens to NH3? What happens to ammonia there? Does it increase or decrease? It increases. Sorry? Increase. Why does it increase? Because if you add more hydrogen with and the nitrogen you said it decreases. Why will it decrease? Because hydrogen is more. Good. So okay. Um, do you think it's going to increase or decrease? Remember, um, you said equilibrium will shift to the right already. So that means the reactant stress is the reactant part is already stressed. So what happens to night? What happens to ammonia? We would have we would definitely have more ammonia because equilibrium is actually shifting there. Do you understand that? Remember what you said, when the system is stressed, Le yes. the uh, equilibrium position shifts to counteract that stress. That means to favor that stress. 
to favor the counterpart of that stress. So that means um, if the equilibrium position shifts to the right, it's actually favoring more production, more production of NH3, of ammonia. So that means ammonia there would increase. Ammonia there would increase. Okay, so um, K is actually what we call equilibrium constant. I've not taught you that. So um, I wouldn't know if you understand equilibrium constant, but um, equilibrium constant there would remain the same. All right, so this is just an example. This is just an example to show you um, effect of concentration. I think you see now we're having a... Um, we are having increase in temp. No, we don't need to go into temperature. We've not done temperature first. All right. Now let's look at effect of increase in pressure. Come in. Let me see if I could reduce this. Um, okay. Let's look. Uh, for, please forget the temperature for now. We're not considering temperature. Let's look at increase in pressure. Sorry. Let's look at increase in pressure. Where would equilibrium shift to? The side with fewer moles. So what is the side with fewer moles? As, as the right hand side. Yeah, it favors the right hand side. Okay, and a decrease in pressure, where, is, where will equilibrium shifts to? The left hand, Wait, where's the side? Yeah, the left hand side. The left hand side, okay. So, um, I'm coming. I have to look for, I think we have, um, Um, come in, please. Yeah, I want to get down something. Um, Okay, let's see this other part. Just plot out a different question entirely. Okay. H2I2. Okay, look at this other part. Um, let's look at the from the first one. So can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Now, let's look at this. When we add, when we add, yeah, hold on. Okay, let's look at this. All right. When we add um, more iodine, sorry, I'm coming. OK. 
guess I should have more questions. Okay, please, I need you to check, do those things. Those things are seen on my screen now. Why I look for other kinds of questions. Oh, are you still seeing my screen, please? No. Okay, what about now? Yes. Okay. All right, um, just tell me where you stopped. Let's, I think I have many more questions. So let's not waste our time on this. Uh, where is the question? Come on. Oh, God. Okay. Ah, where is it now? I'm serious. Okay. Now, when we added um, iodine, when we add iodine, where would the equilibrium shift to? The right. To the right. Okay. Um, what will happen to H2? It decrease. It will decrease. Awesome. Uh, we know I2. Let's leave I2 there. What happens to um, hydrogen iodide? Increases. Sorry? It increases. Increases, correct. Please, let's do, um, let's do, um, when we remove H2, that's hydrogen. Where will equilibrium shift to? To the left. To the left, awesome. Now let's go to increase in temp in pressure. What happens to equilibrium, Equi increase in pressure? It goes to the, it goes to the side with the fewer moves and that okay. is the left side. The left side, are you sure? What is the effect yeah. of pressure on this? I not I not seen that they have the same moves. So compress it. Sorry. Yes. So what happens to if effect? Of, yes. So what happens to effect of pressure? 
Nothing. Nothing. Correct. There is no effect of equilibrium here. Why? Because the um, they have the same moves. So equilibrium would the, the system is already at equilibrium here, since they have um, the same moves. All right. That's just what I wanted to um, bring out. That's all I wanted to bring out from there. Uh, remember, we've not talked about temperature. I have a reason for that. I've not touched temperature. So um, I just want us to solve some questions before going into um, temperature. And that's why we have not done that. Um, I'm trying to get gather questions. Trying to gather questions. Okay. Um, think I'm coming trying to look out for, look out for questions okay I think I'm going to send you a question now so I'll need you to start looking at them it has to do with um, endothermic and exothermic reaction. Um, let me send that to you now. There's, there's an awesome question I'm seeing here on um, endothermic and exothermic reaction. Like it's really, really good. It's really, really nice question. And then we would have to go through them. So, um, I have to download that chemistry. Um, um, chemical. Okay, so I'm sending it to you right away. Chat and then chemical energetics. Where are you? Chemistry, I just say. So. Okay, um, it's going now. I, I have you received it? Yes. Okay. Um, I need to go through that question. Go through the question. That's a an IGCS question on endothermic and exothermic reaction. Please go through them. Uh, probably you stop at. I should start now. So please start now. Yes. Um... That is strictly on endothermic and exothermic reactions. And then you see how to answer the, the questions. Probably we'll stop at 20. 